Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where your time zone is. So today, I'd like to talk about the marama bean, Thylacema esculentum, which is an orphan legume, and what we're trying to do to develop it as a crop. To start with, I'd like to acknowledge the people who have been involved in this collaboration, which is between Case Western Reserve University, Namibia University of Science and Technology and the University of Pretoria. And the main participants are Professor Percy Chimwamuyorombi from NUST, Carl Kunnert and John Foster from the University of Pretoria, Mutsu Takonda, who was a PhD student at the University of Namibia. It's been supported by a number of places, including the Kirkhouse Trust, um, the Nord Foundation grant from the, at Case Western Reserve, a grant from the International Center of Case Western Reserve and teaching laboratory support at Case Western Reserve University. And the more than 100 students who have participated in the laboratory course that has been developing the molecular tools for Marama. So globally, there are many tens of thousands of edible plants, but only about 5% of these have ever been used to any extent for human nutrition. More specifically, only four species, wheat, rice, corn, and soybean, cover about 75% of the total area planted worldwide. Many of these underutilized plant species are known as orphan crops because they've been used locally, historically, but are underrepresented in scientific and improvement programs. These plants do have some agronomic data available to underpin improvement programs, but they don't have a big enough footprint to make it worthwhile for major funding agencies or conglomerates to actually be involved in their development. Today, I want to concentrate on one of these plants that's been used as a food source, but has never actually been grown in formal agriculture. Right? These, this food crop is Marama, the Latin name Tylosema esculentum, and it has been long identified as one of those orphan crops. Marama is actually somewhat different from many of the other orphan crops in that it has not even been cultivated in former agriculture, but just collected from the wild and so there's a great diversity of phenotypes that are out there and the characteristics that might make a reasonable basis for improving the overall yield and thereby generating it as an adoption as a crop. However, I need to emphasize that in fact, we're not trying to have Marama to displace any current food crop but it may really well have a role to play as a rescue food crop because it always provides some yield irrespective of what the rainfall is. And it grows when none of the competing, even those drought tolerant crops can provide a predictable yield. So it's, it's something that, that may well be useful. It's been used, but it's only ever been collected from the wild. So Marama bean is one of these ones that Oops, Marama bean has a really nice set of large seeds that contain high levels of protein and unsaturated fats. It has an excellent nutritional profile. The protein and oil composition is similar to peanut and soybean, and it contains a really useful lot of micronutrients. So it contains phosphorus, calcium, vitamins A, B3, B6, folic acid, B12, vitamin E, iron, zinc, and iodine. So it's a, it's a really interesting food source that's obviously being used, and we'd like to try to... Uh, capture some of this 
importance. Obviously, if it's going to be a useful crop, it would also be important to have some products being made from it. And so far, there are a number of potential consumer products that have been identified. So the protein and oil uses are likely to be similar to those of other nuts and nut products and oils. Uh, so we can obviously we use it as a protein source or as an oil source, since it has a large amount of each of those. Um, other possible products are that it could be used as roasted marama nuts and cookies as snacks. Marama flour, which would be high in protein to fortify sorghum and, or maize porridges, or products like marama soaps and lotions as other consumable entities. And there are also possible pharmaceutical applications. However, there's still a lot of work to be done to decide where these products might fit into the commercial market, but there are possible commercial avenues apart from it just being used as a food source, as a rescue food source for resource poor farmers. So marama is a wild, non-nodulating, trailing, prostrate legume that produces seeds and tubers. The main populations are in Botswana around the central Kalahari, Namibia, and small populations in Limpopo and Gauteng provinces in South Africa. The tubes, the tubers and the seeds are edible after roasting or cooking. Um, they're rich in protein and oil. The tuber itself is rich in starch. Um, and so considering where it grows, it has the potential to be a low input sustainable crop for subsistent agriculture in these arid areas where few conventional crops can survive. And what we would like to do is to try to develop some high yielding cultivars in the shortest possible time. In order to make it an attractive option, we have to be able to do that and we're going to try and use molecular breeding techniques to shorten the possible time for development. So one of the characteristics of Marama is that it's extremely drought tolerant. Here are a couple of pictures taken on the same day, one year apart. In 2019, there was a drought where only one millimeter of rain fell, but Marama is growing better than anything else. So these, most of this green stuff here is Marama growing. There's sort of very scrubby, grass growing a little bit. You can see there's large patches of bare earth, even as you get out into the, the general felt. In 2020, it was a much norm, more normal year for uh, rainfall. And as you can see, it, the vegetation is much more lush and Marama itself has grown very much better. So as you can see from these trees here, this is exactly the same aspect in both cases. Um, in 2019, they were marama growing well enough that in fact they flowered and were setting seed where none of the other crops around, even drought tolerant ones like cowpea, were actually growing at all well. So it can survive really well when there's very little rainfall. Um, it doesn't form nodules, uh, which actually is, in this case, may actually be an advantage because it renders Marama less sensitive to soil water deficit than those legumes that really do rely on nodulation for a nitrogen source. What the nitrogen source for Marama is, is still unknown. And part of the reason that we will be investigating the soil microbiome, which we'll refer to later, is in fact to try to understand um, whether that aids the extraction of nutrients from the soil. At least part of the drought tolerance of Marama is in fact due to the very large tuber that can be made, um, which can actually weigh up to, to more than 250 kilograms. So here is a group of students that went with me to the University of Namibia and dug up this tuber and in fact, we're trying to weigh it. And what you can see 
is that it is the same weight as three students, large male students, which were about weight of combined about 250 kilos. As noted a little bit earlier in good seasons, marama can grow really rapidly during the growing season. This here is a picture of some of the plant, two of the plants at the University of Pretoria farm. This in the foreground here is a single plant. And in the background is a second plant. All of this vegetation has grown in a single growing season. So when, when the rains come or when it starts to sprout, if it's using water that's stored in the tuber, it grows really rapidly, can grow really lushly. And as I say, this is just a single season's growth. And these two plants you can see grow really quite differently, even though they're under essentially identical conditions. And so we had many more seeds produced on this one than this one. So we have a difference um, for trying to develop things that are better. But overall, these large plants like this can cover an area that's sort of circular, that's more than five meters in diameter. So they, they, can, they can grow really well. So the resources that we've sort of developed so far, we've assembled a whole genome sequence from next generation Illumina sequencing, which is good enough to uh, identify genes. We also have next generation home genome sequencing of 54 other individuals, and we're waiting for a 30X PAC bio hi-fi set of reads, which we believe will really improve the assembly of the genome for Marama. We also have 40 individuals from a single plant to facilitate genetic mapping that we also have next generation sequencing from. And so we hope to start to be able to identify agronomically related genes. And finally, we also have soil microbiome data from multiple sites and multiple plants. So we can use this to try to identify if there are some really useful microbiome resources that may actually explain how Marama manages to grow so well in these relatively nutritionally poor soils. And hopefully they may actually provide a basis for maybe some biofertilizers that can be used in other agricultural settings. So the objectives of this project are to really domesticate this plant to provide improved germplasm to resource poor farmers. We're trying to improve the yield by increasing the number of seeds per pod, the number of pods per plant, the vigor of the individuals and more uniform plants so we can have a predictable, sustainable yield. We need to understand the reproductive mechanisms and what the pollinators are and how far does pollen travel. One of the things that's hindering development of, of Marama is that it's essentially an obligate outbreaker, outcrosser. We'd like to break this in self-incompatibility. We've got the sequence and identified what we think are the genes that are the basis for self-incompatibility. And therefore using CRISPR or RNAi, we're trying to overcome self-incompatibility so we can develop inbred lines into which we can stack beneficial alleles and develop F1 hybrids, which hopefully will actually show heterosis. And it's these uniform F1 hybrids that would actually be provided to farmers. Right? Having got those, we would obviously then like to develop some seed orchards to design the best arrangement of plants, identifying the good parents, because obviously, we're not going to try to send out genetically modified marama beans. So we've got to work out how, which individuals will actually be compatible. So then in fact, we will have decent seed set. Nothing would be worse than having fields of plants that are all the same in self and compatibility group, and therefore nothing gets set. So this is the kind of scheme that we were looking at at the moment, which was adapted from the development of hybrid potatoes using genomics. So we would like to start off by breaking self incompatibility, um, by knocking out those genes. And so therefore we can then uh, be able to generate inbred lines from there, 
we will be able to start to identify beneficial alleles and we can stack those in different lines. Following that, we would then be hopefully be able to cross these, get F1 hybrids, which now should be uniform because we have these inbred parents um, that will actually be showing heterosis. And therefore we can now have an, a strong F1 with heterosis that we can send out to um, growers in arid regions in the developing world. And so that's the scheme of which we're trying to do. We're also looking at the rhizosphere at this stage so that we can identify um, how does Marama acquire nutrients when it really doesn't have a very extensive root system and it grows in low fertility sandy soils. Um, we now have bacterial and fungal diagnostic sequences from, as I say, a number of different sites. And so we particularly want to understand, do different individuals acquire nutrients in a different way? So if we look at the vigor of plants, is the rhizosphere different depending on how well the plant is growing? And can we identify those beneficial microbes that are in fact aiding Marama both to acquire nutrients and maybe even add to the overall ability to tolerate drought. Um, so that's in the rhizosphere. And as I said earlier on, we're obviously trying to develop molecular markers for the genetic mapping. We want to understand pollination and the distance parameters. We want to have to look at the long range sequencing to assemble an improved genome, and then also um, develop sufficient progeny for a, from a single plant so that we can have a decent genetic map that will help us do that. We just went through that with the, 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 the microbiome. Um, since it doesn't nodulate, we know that it's not getting nitrogen from nitrogen fixation. The one piece that we'd also like to know is whether or not the, the plant, does the plant nutrition, its value actually affect the seed composition. So when those are growing really well, is the seed composition the same as those that are growing poorly? And does it matter, especially what microbiome you've got, does that affect the seed composition? Because that may really be very important. So if we want to introduce the crop into formal agriculture, we obviously have to develop the high yielding varieties, but farmers, but we also have to be sure that in fact, people are prepared to grow it. You know, it would be pretty useless if we had really nice seeds, gave them out and nobody wanted them. And so during this process, um, Professor Chimwamarombi has been recruiting a number of farmers and local populations in Namibia to multiply the seeds and also collect them from the wild. These are also being distributed to anybody who requests them in other arid regions of the world for testing the usefulness and acceptability of this crop. And in this way, we hope we will be able to identify agronomic issues as we develop high yielding varieties. And so we're trying to put all of these pieces together so that when we actually have a, a potential crop, we also have buy-in from individuals who will be prepared to grow it. So overall, if we start off with the wild underutilized legume, which is the marama bean, we're trying to go through this as to what is the nutritional value, what are the functional properties, bioactive compounds, pharmaceutical values, anti-nutrients and toxins and things, and how do we go through and process that. Um, there's a product development um, for marama bean products, but underpinning this before we can do any of this, we have to have some germplasm that can be grown and generate sufficient yield to make it worthwhile. And with that, I'll say thank you for your attention.
and sign off. Thank you.